All right, should we reduce our sales tax? There is a conversation percolating on Smith Hill. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Don't ever start, where are you? Don't ever, don't ever start a show with a mint. Holy cow. I hope this is not the way the entire evening is going to go, but this is called semi-live television. How are you? It is great to have you aboard. Thanks for tuning in to my state of mind, which is fine. It's just that <clears throat> you shouldn't have the mint before you start. Okay, you want to reduce the sales tax in Rhode Island from 7 to 3%? Sure. All right, well, we solved that one, right? Uh, one of the, well, the, co the chief sponsor, I guess, of a bill to begin the conversation uh, is here tonight, and uh, he'll explain what the theory is behind this. And then we'll talk about sales theory, you know, or I should say tax theory in general between Rhode Island and Massachusetts as we go. Great to have you, and thank you for tuning in. <clears throat> I'm good. Let's go to the, uh, huh. maybe I need medical something, medical merger here. This is uh, fascinating news. We have uh, a situation here where it's going to be one big hospital before it's all over. A headline in the Providence Journal today uh, talks about this shakeup appearing imminent, uh, and, and the hospital deal is, is really, really a fascinating thing. Uh, women and Infants and the company that owns it, uh, Care New England, will be merging with a, Rhode Island, uh, with a Massachusetts company uh, because they just can't survive in their particular uh, state, even though they are nonprofit. The hospital business, you know, feels like a big, big, big profit center, but it is a really difficult business to run, and uh, the accounting on it is always something that I find incredibly difficult to follow. We will bring in some experts on this next week to talk about this entire concept of hospital mergers. You know, at this point, between um, the entire si situation of, of, of hospital companies in New England right now, we're going to be down to two here in Rhode Island and perhaps heading to even a larger merger down the line. We'll check that out for you because, you know, as consumers, we need to know exactly who's providing our health care. Uh, Patriots at the White House. This was uh, dwarfed in a lot of ways by the cycle of news yesterday. And then the New York Times even tried to put a bigger damper on it by suggesting, not unlike the inauguration, that the, uh, the turnout seemed to be a, bit, a little bit less the turnout of patriots, well, you know, the patriots fired back, the president fired back, everybody was firing back, suggesting, well, the seating chart was just different. That's all. Uh, Bob Kraft, of course, was uh, high level. We have the privilege of coming here to the White House. I think about the long odds that were faced by our country's forefathers who fought for our freedom and independence. Overcoming long odds through hard work, perseverance, and most importantly, mental toughness is the foundation of everything that is great about this country. Yeah, always a good day uh, when the Patriots get their Super Bowl props. And of course, there were half a dozen players that said they didn't want to be at the White House, which is the current state of things. No longer do the companies dictate to the employees exactly what they need to do. Employees and the First Amendment rights seem to carry the day. Uh, you can decide for yourself whether that's good or not, but no one's not going to play an athlete because they decided they wouldn't go to the White House. The Patriots, with all the good feeling about them, are the toughest when it comes to mercenary decisions on the field, and that's why they keep winning Super Bowls, meaning if somebody's good enough to play, it doesn't matter if they didn't show up to the White House. Um, in the meantime, this is uh, as disturbing as it gets, not scripture, but that this was reportedly written in blood on Aaron Fernandez, or Hernandez's head. Uh, and of course, after the news of his demise in his jail cell, the headlines are rolling like crazy here. Uh, family seeks probe, and then you get the lawyer who says, listen, there was no indication. Well, why would there be? In other words, why would he admit there was one? If they didn't reach out, they certainly don't want that liability. And then you've got the agent tweet that says, no way this happened. And then there's an angle of the families involved in this awful drama. He was surprised that they, uh, he never thought that he would, uh, that Aaron Lawrence would reject his own life. Through an interpreter, Salvatore Furtado explained that he is a Christian man who believes life is a gift from God that should never be taken. Only God has the, the right to, to take uh, somebody's life. That is, uh, he says, it's very painful to him. 
the when someone somebody takes their own life. Attorney William Kennedy says it was also painful for Furtado to be in court for the trial. Every day he said that he was at court, it was like uh, reliving the death of his son again. And certainly when the verdict came in, that increased the pain uh, with the thought that uh, the person that was believed to be responsible was not going to be held accountable. Kennedy says he filed a wrongful death civil suit even before the criminal trial began. He expects the civil case to pick back up, in which case the prosecution has to prove a preponderance of evidence. It's a lesser standard. Uh, we believe that we have a, uh, a very good civil case. But what Kennedy says the victim's families don't want to get lost in the Hernandez tragedy, these two young men who worked hard and only went out one night a week to have fun. Those two friends now buried next to each other. The one thing that I think that they feel as if probably has been overlooked is that all of the attention that's been drawn on a star of former patriots, not enough attention has been drawn on who these people were. You know, there's going to be a little bit of drama here in terms of the financial estate, whatever's left of it, and I have no idea what's left of it, and I haven't seen any reports as to the specific monetary value of Hernandez. I mean, certainly the, the legal fees to, to defend these cases uh, must be monstrous. Um, but there is a Massachusetts law that allows for verdicts to be vacated when uh, one is appealing the verdict and passes away. Uh, how that implicates any kind of what the family might get or what the defense in the civil lawsuit might be uh, is still kind of up in the legal air. We're going to get some interpretation on that in the days to come, uh, and I'm sure there'll be some terrific reporting going on on that. But uh, to, to think that Aaron Hernan Hernandez might have done this in order to protect his financial interest is a percolating conversation out there, not one that I'm buying into yet, but uh, we're never going to get the full answers, right? Because when somebody does this, they aren't around to explain it. And of course, on a much lighter note, when it comes to the Patriots, the funniest moment in Washington yesterday was when Gronk jumped into Sean Spicer's world. Need some help? Uh, <laughs> I think I got this, but thank you. Uh, maybe. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. I'll see you in a minute. Uh, hold on. One All right, <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> Only Gronk could get away with that. Uh, it just, the guy's got a happy go lucky disposition, which uh, endears him to everybody White House, Foxborough, maybe even the opponents. I'm not so sure, but good stuff. All righty. Uh, the concept of a sales tax. So we saw this headline the other day sales tax considered in Rhode Island. And it was funny, one of the co-sponsors was Joe Sicarci, who's the majority leader in the State House at the House of Representatives. And on the radio the other day, I asked him, you know, how committed he was to this concept. Uh, it's not my bill. I'm just a co-sponsor. It's Representative Nunes' bill, and you'd have to ask him. But I sit next to him, and he, we, we talk about a lot of things, and this is one of the things he talked about it. He said, you know, would you co-sponsor the study commission? And I'm all for people studying everything. So uh, I think information is a good thing. Well, it's all about studying everything. And if you, if you, if you sit next to him, he'll co-sponsor your legislation. Is that how it goes, Jared? I actually sit behind him, so <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the key. I don't know. Uh, you are the actual uh, brain trust uh, behind this. Uh, State Representative Jared Nunes is with us. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Anytime. Give me the... Give me the, the Cliff's notes on what this is all about. Well, you know, it, it really is a major, it would be a major policy shift for the state. And it's not something that you can just do willy-nilly, put in, you know, put in a bill to just cut the sales tax down without knowing how you're going to get from the 7 to 3 mm. or, or anywhere in between there. So the, the idea behind it is to maximize the, you know, economic advantage for Rhode Island and you know, possibly stimulate some some additional uh, commercial traffic in Rhode Island through lowering the sales tax, maybe enticing new businesses to come here, or at least people that are here to spend more money because they're getting less tax. And the purpose of the study commission is to put the, you know, to put it forward in a serious manner. I mean, I could have just put a bill in that said, uh, starting January 1st of 2018, the sales tax is going to go from 7 to 3. But I, I didn't do that because you, you have to know how you're going to do it and whether or not you can well, do nobody, it. Well, nobody, I mean, it, it, it would never see the light of day. It wouldn't even see 
a hearing. Right, right. and the, the, you know, I, I don't think anybody out there would say that they don't want the sales tax to be 3%. The question is really, how do you get from 7 to 3% responsibly, and will the revenue that you're foregoing be recouped by increased economic activity. And maybe it won't be such, a, su such an uphill climb if, if it can be proven that the increased economic activity would offset some of the, the, the losses in tax revenue. The Center for Freedom and Prosperity first proffered this and has been really the main sponsor of this. Is this a cue from them that you're taking? It's, it's an idea, you know, it, they, they put out a couple of studies relating to this and, and you know, I found those intriguing. Um, I, I've always had the political philosophy that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And if, if you have a philosophy like that, then you, you know, you, you f the more money you can keep in Rhode Islanders' pockets, the better off the state's going to be. And I believe in that that's really the, the, the safest and best path to economic prosperity is to keep more of the people's money in their own pockets. So I, I think it's a... I, I do think it's a reasonable idea to to lessen the sales tax. I mean, it affects everybody. All right, right? when we come back, we'll talk about the priorities because there's a bunch of taxes in the mix. Stay with us. Dan, as much as I'd like to say, and I think it's good that we do look at our neighbors, I think we do need to be competitive and we do beat our neighbors when it comes to corporate tax and a lot of different things. We're not Massachusetts. We don't have that high-tech engine called the 128 corridor that's generating high-tech jobs and everything else. We need to look at this thing in much more detailed, much more uh, thoughtful way than to say we need to just whatever Massachusetts do and do it better. I wish we could have school education better. I wish we could do a lot of things better than Massachusetts, but we can't. We can only do some things better. Uh, and it was a kind of a funny answer to a broad question that the uh, majority leader gave me on the radio. Again, he co-sponsored uh, Representative Noon's bill, but uh, wasn't that committed to it. The 7% sales tax reduced to 3 and even the study about it. Uh, and I asked him about philosophy, and Jared and I actually had the conversation on the radio last week as well. Uh, you actually said something funny during the break, which is you, don't see, you, you, you observe that you don't think I'm too excited about your proposal. I think reducing the sales tax by, you know, 70% is an exciting thing. It just has to be, it has to be in context of what is the overall philosophy, what is the overall plan, who suffers, what's the upside, downside, and clearly that's why you want to see a study commission for right. this. Um, at, at the same time, it, it, it used to be, you know how in Rhode Island everything's used to be? Everything used to be somewhere, that's how we get around, right? It used to be that uh, elected officials would at least come to the table with some philosophy and or studied homework before they say, hey, here's an idea flying off the wall and let's study it. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, do, do, do you, when, when you say you'd like to reduce the sales tax from seven to three, is that a goal that you have in mind? You want to drive it and you've got the data to prove it? Or is that just kind of a, hey, I'd like to join the conversation about economics in this state and let's, let's play around with this one? Well, there, there have been, there's been a few small studies that, that, that show that it can, it can certainly stimulate the economy and, and drive, the, drive revenues up as far as the retailers go. So if, if you know... It, it's a big enough gap that people make a decision on the border of Mass, right. Connecticut, and Rhode Island to shop here. Exactly. So if you're in Mass currently is whatever, 6.25, Connecticut I think is 6.5%. So I mean, if in my mind anyways, reducing it to 6% is not going to give us the really, you know, we're going to forego the revenue from 7 to 6%, but it's not going to be enough of a drive to get somebody to get in their car and go from Seekonk to Providence or you know, wherever, from Westerly to, uh, from Connecticut, uh, Sterling to Westerly, whatever. Depending on what you're buying, but I understand. Right. I mean, maybe if it's a big purchase. So, you know, y y there needs to be, there needs to be enough of an incentive to really drive the, the dynamic model of, of forecasting. You know, if, if you, if you don't look, you, you can't just look at it as, all right, we're going to forego this much revenue and, you know, how are we going to make that up? Because there, there's going to be an offset because of the increase in, in retail traffic in the state. So uh, I guess what I'm asking is, do you have a goal in mind here or just a conversation starter? 
Well, I think this is the conversation starter, and I think that you know the study commission is really what what's going to dictate where we can be with it responsibly, while maintaining the the level of 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 services that the state's accustomed to. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to come up. I'm not hard on the the hard and fast on the three uh, percent. If if we come back and say you know four percent could work, and we think that you know through the modeling, this is, this is how it, it, would, it would happen. This is how we would get from here to there. Well, the question that I had for the majority leader and the, the conversation that you and I had last week is about philosophy. You know, I can't figure out why we don't have a philosophy in Rhode Island to be ultra competitive on every sales, I should say every tax platform. And maybe that does mean it's seven, it's six and a quarter percent to 5.5, but that's just the sales tax. And so maybe there's a property tax quotient now that we can, we can tackle that even advantages uh, Rhode Islanders better than Proposition 2.5 does in Massachusetts. And then there's an income tax rate that is always going to be competitive, and we build it that it's always going to be X minus because we have a philosophy of beating our neighbors. I don't understand why we don't do that. Dan, we can't even do that in this state. All right. If you live in if you live in Coventry, we'll say, and you have a two hundred thousand dollar home, you're paying over four thousand dollars a year in property tax. If you live in Narragansett and you have that same two hundred thousand dollar home, you're only paying two thousand dollars a year in property tax. So, if we can't even get it done at the city level, as far as equalizing our tax well, burden on the, on the constituents, then how, how do you expect us to go from Rhode Island, you know, compare us ourselves to Massachusetts or Connecticut? Well, I think I mean, that's a good question. I, I think it's pretty. The culturally uniform from state to state that communities set their property tax rates. Um, car taxes are a different story. Obviously in Massachusetts, no matter where you are, you pay the same tax on your car, which I am dying for us to acquire. I don't know why we can't uh, ad adopt what Massachusetts is doing, knowing that of course it's in context of also a total property tax overhaul that the voters demanded via voter initiative two decades ago, meaning property taxes and Prop 2.5 came as a package with the car tax uh, change for $25 per thousand with a declining, you know, on paper rate. I mean, this notion that you have to li literally take care of your car um, or how you take care of your car has to do with how your vehicle is valued, which has to do with how your car, your car is taxed. It's nuts. We're kind of getting off the subject. but. Uh, <sighs> Look, you're, you're, and I say this respectfully, you're just a state rep from Coventry. You're just one guy throwing up some ideas here. Whether the study commission actually gets created is probably a slim chance as well, because uh, you don't have veteran status in the General Assembly right now. No, I mean, I, this is my fourth term. I mean, I've been there for longer than some, but not as long as, as most. Right. But, you know, I, again, I think it, it boils down to philosophy, and the philosophy that I'm trying to, to put out there to everybody else is is kind of what you're talking about that you know we need to start looking at this thing globally and putting more money into Rhode Islanders pockets because they're the ones who are going to spend the money and you know you can't just look at it as you know the state and government itself is going to is going to stimulate the economy by by pulling money out of the people and, and dis distributing in, in other ways it has to come the the, the best way to prosperity I think for Rhode Island is to is to leave people with more of their money a lot of people just want to be left alone and they want to be able to spend their money the way they want to spend it and they don't want the government taking it look the speech is probably gonna earn plaudits from viewers right now but it's a very in the old days you'd call it a Republican speech we'll talk about the politics of, of this conversation when we come back stay with us I will tell you that the show during the breaks is as good, maybe even better than the uh, the conversation that we're having here. Um, you take umbrage with even the question <laughs> over over the notion that you you're espousing at least on tax concepts what would be traditionally a, a more Republican philosophy. Uh, this is a state that has a tremendous party imbalance. I hear all the time, especially on the radio, the complaints that. You know, we're a one-party state, blah, 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 blah. I've tried to get people off that because I never see that the Republican Party is actually going to get to a place where uh, it has at least a systemic impact. Um, that may change with some of the liberal progressive movement coming inside your Democratic Party. 
uh, and whether there's more teaming up going on with the more conservative fiscal Democrats like yourself um, and the Republicans. But tell me about the politics in the, in the General Assembly of having a Democrat looking to save taxes and, and actually playing off the sheet that the Center for Freedom and Prosperity has laid out. You know, I maybe it's a product of, of my district or I I really don't I really don't know. I didn't think I was I was I didn't think I was much different than, than a lot of other Democrats up there. There's you know, I represent a working class area. I mean you, you talk West Warwick and Coventry, it's all they're old mill towns. It's it's blue collar all the way, working class people. The, you know, God fearing people is it's you know, high, heavily Catholic and that's it's it's people that are very self reliant and they, they watch their you know they watch their their dollars and they want the state to do the same thing that they do on a on a daily basis you know they don't want to they don't mind paying taxes but they don't want they don't want wasteful spending and they don't want excess and you know when 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 people are struggling to put food on their table and put their kids through college and and, and pay f their bills they don't want the state to be to be you know blowing all their tax dollars through corporate welfare and you know all sorts of other schemes that that just I yeah, mean it's, no, it's I, a, I, I, I think it's a reasonable I, 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 I find it both refreshing and disturbing at the same time that that you know this these kinds of conversations are starting you know from inside the Democratic Party um, and tell me about the politics of, 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 of the party right now and do you think that a you share enough juice now that you've been here now in your fourth term with leadership to actually have this become a constructive conversation, or do they find this like a, you know, a, a nuisance? I mean, I, I don't get the vibe that they, they feel it as a nuisance. You know, I, so I, Karchi signing on is a plus, and then he more or less dismisses it as just another sheet of paper that went, you know, went by him on a given day because you were sitting next to him. I, I, don't, I have a different theory on that. I don't believe that's the case. I think you know, I, I supported uh, and I, I support Matty Ello as speaker. I, I've, I think he's a big change from the only other speaker that that I knew as a representative. He's more fiscally conservative. Much, much more fiscally conservative. And I, we, we think alike on a lot of on a lot of issues. We think differently on a lot of issues too. But, you know, I, I supported him. I voted for him. I, I supported uh, Joe Shikarchi, and I think they're both very pragmatic leaders, and they have, in their positions. They're in a different spot than I am because they have 74, you know, or 73 other reps that they need to they need to they need to govern and maintain the integrity of the body. So they may not be able to. They can't come out and say the types of things that I can say. You know, I only have to worry about my 14,000 constituents in West Warwick and Coventry. Mm. They have to worry about their constituents and so, and, and, and as so, well as the 74 and, other people and, in the room. And so that you know begs a question. I only have about 15 seconds here. Uh, do you throw it out there just to say, hey, look, I'm fiscally conservative with knowing there's no shot of the conversation happening, or do you really think that you're going to be able to get something going on this? I think it's, I think it's a, you know, it's just like, it's just like a progressive putting out an idea like paid family leave. You know, they put out the idea, it might not happen this year, but, you know, or paid sick time rather. Right. It may not happen this year, but, you know, maybe it's, it, it gets the conversation moving. Right. Well, certainly good here. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Final word when we come back. Coming up tomorrow night, roundtable conversation, Dan McGowan and Ted Nisi from WPRI and WPRI.com. There's so many things on the agenda from the politics of 2018 to what's happening in the White House to media and Bill O'Reilly and all that. So I hope you'll tune in tomorrow night. See you on the radio at 3 on WPRO.